One farmer says, seems to me there was a tea party in Boston that was illegal too. I have directed Secretary Connolly to suspend temporarily the convertibility of the dollar into gold. We shall seek to establish and maintain a dollar which will not change its purchasing and debt-paying power during the succeeding generation. As anguished shrieks rose up from the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. Government credit and government currency are really one and the same thing. A reserve of gold and a small reserve of silver. Why do central banks hold it? Well, it's, it's a form of reserves. So why don't they hold diamonds? Well, it's tradition, long-term <laughs> tradition. You know, some people still think it's money. If you're only tuning in for the first 10 seconds, the Dow touched on negative 1,300 points. It's over 1,200 points in the red in the futures market right now. Gold broke $1,700 an ounce, and oil plummeted to 30%. That's just the skinny. That's the, the, the quick down and dirty of what's taking place. Now, I wasn't really aware all of this was taking place until around 2 o'clock this afternoon. I was busy doing some chores and some work around the place uh, when a really close friend of the channel here, one of the best guys, good contributor, and someone who's very deep in the oil industry, contacted me and said, you have to see what's going on. And then he also emailed us uh, some of his take on what's taking place right now, what we're seeing happen. The short of it was, we've got the OPEC-Russia price war on oil. OPEC was going to cut production, told Russia they should do also. Russia said, no, we're not going to. And then it became an all-out war with OPEC not only cutting uh, the price, but ramping up production, crippling the oil price and anyone exposed to it. Now, just think of the, the ramifications of this, the banks that are exposed, uh, many of the U.S. oil fields that cannot turn a profit unless oil is much higher than what we're seeing on the boards right now, $50, $60 a barrel. And it's crashing down. It's in the, It was in the high 20 I think it was $27 a barrel moments ago. It's been just in a free fall state this evening. So we're going to read what our friend sent us. We'll talk about some of the numbers on the board. Yes, gold did breach 1700 and then has retreated somewhat since then. I think the last numbers I saw uh, 1686. Tomorrow, it most likely could close above 1700. Now this is something we've been talking about since the beginning of this year, since last year. It's been $1700 gold coming September again. We're going to ignore that the whole flu thing that's taking place because, that, again, remember, that is not the reason you're seeing what's taking place in the economy. If anything, it's a distraction. Yeah, supply chains and quarantines are kind of disrupting some things, but that is not the primary reason and causation for what is taking place. Remember, this economy was suffering, and the things that we were seeing trigger it. All of the red flags were happening before any of this Wu-Tang flu came out, so... The Kung Fu flu is not the reason for this. Obviously, Russia and OPEC are not deciding oil prices based on the Wu-Tang. Not at all. So look at the charts here quickly. There you can see the futures market for the Dow, 24,555. It's down 4.78%, down 1,234 points. It's going to be uh, an interesting Monday there at Wall Street when we see that opening bell ring in the morning. Now, in case any of you forgot, all of these markets being down almost 5% right now are following two weeks that saw around 10% declines in the markets as well. Over 5 to $6 trillion wiped off the books here in the United States and abroad. So with already 10% down, we're seeing 5% overnight. Who knows what this week could bring. It really does paint the picture of what we were talking about months ago. And remember, I'm not some oracle. I'm not the oracle of Omaha. I'm not this, like, Buffett guy. Not at all. I never claimed it once. Not at all. No, this, is, this channel itself is really just a medium in which this information passes through. We've got a lot of supporters, uh, a lot of different uh, contributors of information. And what we do is we peruse that information, we take it in, and we talk about it here in a uh, extemporaneous way.
because it's fun. It's a conversation I've enjoyed having for years, decades even, talking about the uh, global economy, geopolitical risks, commodities, coins, you know. So it all, it all ties into each other. And what we're seeing now is this is definitely up there with the 07, 08 debacle and the Great Recession. Now, is Peter Schiff right? Is this the actual implosion of the derivative market? We're just seeing the beginning of it. Uh, we're going to take a look at an article at the very end of today's discussion. So today, I said, buckle up because it's probably going to be a long video. I got all the time in the world. And we'll take a look at the end there. There's some key points to bring up. But first, let's read through what our friend in the oil business sent us. Recent news of Saudi Arabia encouraging OPEC members to cut production will make shockwaves this coming week. Most members are already struggling with economic hardship and have long-term production contracts to honor. Unable to reach a consensus, Saudi Arabia has pledged to ramp production to crash crude oil prices, pumping at maximum 12 million barrels per day in order to exert its authority. The world is already awash in oil. To further exacerbate the problem, Russia, the world's number three producer of oil, said they are prepared for lower oil prices and also refused to cut production. American political influence to delay the Baltic Sea Nord Stream pipelines, which allow Russia to bypass the Ukraine and sell directly to Germany, probably has a lot to do with Russia's unwillingness to cooperate with America's special partner, Saudi Arabia. Sunday, news leaks of the Japanese yen strengthening an established safe haven will see oil opening Sunday night many dollars lower per barrel. No matter what your views on fracking, it has allowed America to become the world's top oil producer in the past couple years, in excess of 15 million barrels per day. This lowers the trade imbalance considerably and strengthens American oil independence. Another danger is the banking sector's exposure financing American oil operations. If small and medium exploration and production companies go bankrupt due to OPEC's flooding the world with cheap oil, they will take many banks with them. The rock bottom floor for oil is the $15 per barrel Brent crude. WTI could dip lower. If those areas are ever met, then buying shares of large oil companies such as Exxon, BP, and Royal Dutch Shell would be excellent entries. Oil service company Schlumberger would also be nicely priced at that point. Shorting oil and banking sectors via exchange-traded funds going into cash positions or buying physical gold and silver would be very sound decisions this coming week. Cryptocurrencies may at some time in the near future also become a safe haven, but government regulations must come first. So that is the take from, again, one of the dear contributors and uh, dear friends of mine, not only a contributor to the channel, but just a very close friend and, and a good person all around. And again, I, I won't disclose who he is, where he works, who he works for, but let's just say he's a, a very top guy in the oil world. Uh, and he's done very well for himself because of that. And he has a very firm grasp and a lot of knowledge when it comes to not only the oil industry, but just the entire way global economics works and how it's all tied together with commodities, currency exchanges, and so on and so forth. And that's one of the ways we ended up bonding was uh, just in that kind of discussion, talking about those sorts of things. And eventually we became close friends. And now I count him, I count him on my hand as one of the, you know, if you look at your hand, you only really have five really close friends at most, sometimes people say three. I, I would put him on that hand as one of the one of the top five. So he'll be paying attention to this. And every once in a while, he's down in the comments, but none of you know who he is. So imagine trying to run a country like Iran or Venezuela that depends totally on oil for their economy with what's taking place. Here we have the most valuable commodity in the world, the lifeblood of modern society, and it's cheaper than milk. Many of the small oil companies and banks that are exposed to the oil industry are going to suffer greatly on the back of this current event. 
One thing to consider is the banks that are heavily exposed to oil that are going to suffer major losses this week might have to unload other commodities, especially gold, to cover those losses. We've seen that happen before. It's a common theme. It's a, an expected reaction. So pay attention to that. Even though with this scare taking place and the turbulence that it is showing, gold skyrocketed. It blew past 1700 briefly, kissing that 17 mark and then retreating. We might see some of these institutions unload gold to cover losses uh, with their oil exposure. Now, going with the theme of all of the discussions we have here on the channel, this article came out yesterday, it was yesterday, the day before, day before, March 6th. Uh, next comes the turbulent 20s. I wanted to go through the whole thing and do one of those article readings on here. It's just too long. We don't have the time for that, but I wanted to piggyback some of the highlights of it here on the tail end of this video. And if you guys get the chance, go look it up and read it. It's a good read. A lot of pertinent information in there. A lot of the same themes we discuss here quite often. It's by David Stockman from Peak. Uh, it's in the Peak Prosperity, and then the past 30 years of false prosperity are over. Next comes the turbulent 20s. In short, the world's supply chains are buckling and freezing up, thereby causing production and incomes to fall abruptly. In turn. Shrunken incomes and cash flows will pull the legs out from under the edifice of debt and speculation that has been piled atop the American economy. So both a renewed financial and economic crisis and an abrupt change of course lie dead ahead. The 30-year era of false prosperity is over. Accordingly, the turbulent 20s have begun. This will be a decade when the chickens come home to roost. It will be a time when the cans of delay and denial may no longer be kicked down the road to tomorrow. To the contrary, the 2020s will mark an era when today's economic and political fantasies are crushed by America's accumulated due bills. Bubbles will be burst. Speculators will get carried out on their shields. Easy money wealth will evaporate. Fiscal trauma will ensue the national joyride will end. The decade of reckoning that lies ahead is rooted first and foremost in the fecklessly incurred mega-debts of the private and public sectors alike. Together they have soared to the staggering sum of $75 trillion. That's five times more than the $14 trillion outstanding three decades ago. Yet the proceeds from these massive borrowings were not used to invest and provide for tomorrow, but to live high on the hog today. After three decades of such artificial debt-fueled prosperity, the very warp and woof of American society has been deformed. For example, 80% of U.S. households live essentially hand-to-mouth, but that's not because they are naturally imprudent. It's because they have been incentivized to borrow and spend while being punished for saving and setting aside for life's unforeseen contingencies and setbacks. Likewise, the C-suites of corporate America have been rewarded for strip mining their balance sheets and cash flows in order to pump money into Wall Street for stock buybacks and M&A. But this has caused investment in productive plant, equipment, technology, and human resources to be shortchanged. Consequently, the growth capacity of the Main Street economy has been pr progressively eviscerated, and most especially, the public sector has been fiscally ruined. During the 32 years since Alan Greenspan launched the present era of reckless and relentless monetization of the public debt in 1987, there have been only four balanced budgets sandwiched between 28 years of sheer fiscal promiscuity. That has already taken the federal debt from $3 trillion to $23 trillion, and it's now heading inexorably toward $43 trillion by the end of the 2020s. The public debt to GDP ratio will then reach a Greek style 150%. Worse still, the nation's political system studiously ignores this obvious fiscal malignancy. That's because the Fed and other central banks have removed the sting of rising interest rates and the crowding out of private investment. So politicians have succumbed to the latest version 
of free lunch economics. The fact is, the engines of free market capitalism have been corroded and paralyzed by three decades of bad money and bad policy. What has passed for recovery since the Great Recession has been only a temporary debt-fostered reprieve. Likewise, the soaring stock market reflects the greatest monetary deformation in history, not the rational discounting of a beneficent future. Accordingly, ten malefic trends will dominate national life during the long night of reckoning which lies ahead. 1. Spectacular failure of Keynesian central banking. We've been talking about this literally for decades, especially here on the channel for the last decade. The failure of Keynesian central banking. It will occur and you will likely witness it. Number two, a prolonged painful reversal of the three decade long hyperinflation of financial asset prices that has resulted in the quote, everything bubble. Three, the violent implosion of America's fiscal accounts. For an intensified central bank war on savers, fixed income retirees, and holders of cash. Five, peak debt induced suffocation of domestic economic growth. Six, ferocious global economic headwinds arising from the demise of the Red Ponzi. Seven, an outbreak of unprecedented partisan acrimony rendering Washington completely dysfunctional and imperiling America's very constitutional foundation. 8. The lapse of imperial Washington into belligerence, retreat, and failure all around the planet. Similar to what we've discussed in the past if you looked at the implosion of the economic model uh, with Rome when they began, when their economy shut down and then trade and the entire workings of what would be a sustainable and stable economy when that broke down, that's when Rome really started to crumble. And you can see it evident in the archaeological findings of the coinage. The coinage itself tells the story when it be went from uh, sound money and they began to water it down and plate the coins with silver and remove gold from circulation almost entirely. By the time it got to just bronze, uh, the currency had been destroyed so much so and the spending had gotten so out of hand the entire economy and the empire itself fell apart. Now there were other factors of course but we've done videos on the fall of Rome and how the economic part of that played a major role and you can go back and check those out but that's what we're looking at there when we talk about the, uh, the, the lapse of Imperial Washington into belligerence, the retreat and failure all around the planet. That's what happened with Rome when it kind of just retreated from its borders and it could no longer expand. It couldn't even hold the ground that it got. Now here's a really good one. Okay, Boomer. The baby boom retirement tsunami, which will cause entitlement spending to soar and generational conflict to erupt like never before. We're already seeing that. The whole phrase, okay, Boomer, is a sign of the generational conflict beginning. And you're already seeing blame placed, and some of it rightfully due, to the boomer generation for things they caused and entitlements they took upon themselves that have negatively affected perhaps society or the economy as a whole. So pay attention to number nine going forward. And then number 10, a virulent outbreak of class warfare and redistributionist political conflict unprecedented in American history owing to a stagnating economic pie. Already we're seeing that with the entire Sanders campaign. Uh, just see how much has already come to light with the inner workings of his campaign and many of the staff, their true and core beliefs being more in line with Bolshevik and communist ideals, uh, and violent communist ideals, as a matter of fact. So there's a nice little list for you to refer back to. And again, this article is a pretty good read. This is in line with some of the stuff that I was reading early on before the 0708 crisis hit. And this guy's hitting the nails on the head. He's pointing out stuff that might be uncomfortable to really digest. And some people just, they just can't grasp it. I mean, really, let's, let's be honest here. A lot of people would rather just tune in to Dancing with the Stars or a football game, uh, crack a Miller Lite, and ignore what's actually taking place uh, around them. And that's okay. You know, that, that's what makes them happy. 
Uh, if you're not like that, and you are one of the people that likes to be a little bit more aware of what's taking place, or even move your assets and wealth around accordingly, something like this could have information in it that's of value. Now again, this is a long article, so we're going to wrap it up here and just kind of go through the end here. We've skipped through quite a bit, but uh, we'll just summarize here at the end. And going with what we just talked about, he closes. Moreover, there is a powerful reason to keep abreast of these turbulent 10 trends. To wit, these baleful developments are not just possibilities, they are well-nigh certainties. And they are ultimately rooted in a common cause, namely the three-decade-long explosion of debt, speculation, and financialization that was initiated in October 1987 when Alan Greenspan bailed out Wall Street gamblers and launched what has become a toxic worldwide regime of Keynesian central banking. Consequently, America's current $74 trillion mountain of public and private debt has become contagious. Now, friends, we're going to close here. But again, this article came out two days ago. Uh, we're seeing what's taking place in the oil industry tonight. We've seen gold explode past the 1600 mark early in this year. I mean, think of where we were. It's very difficult sometimes, I think, because you almost become numb to the information, to the numbers we're seeing, to the charts, to the discussions regarding the debt. I mean, how long have we been talking about these multi-trillion dollar debts? And most of you remember the day the U.S. debt crossed the 10 trillion mark, like it was yesterday. And now we're already 23 trillion. And we've discussed the mathematics behind that. Um, we've read through the, the readings of various economics professors like Antal Fiquet, discussing the impossibility of these numbers and what they truly mean. So take all that into account. Uh, again, keep your eyes on what's going on and join the discussion down below. You know, I don't have a whole lot more to offer you today other than the information we've already covered. We're 22 minutes into the most boring channel on YouTube, the Junius Malby channel. So 22 minutes in, we'll call it good for tonight. Thanks for tuning in. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Thank all of you, all of you for your support and uh, perseverance here, always taking part, but also supporting the channel. It's appreciated. Thank you all. Have a good night.